All right, we'll get started here this morning. Uh, so uh, added a little a QR code for those. Uh, this is to help register for the uh, sign in for the event. And then there will be a code at the very end uh, to establish CME as well. And the website's there. And I think uh, Dr. Jensen will also put the uh, links into the chat as well. All right, so a uh, pleasure of uh, two speakers uh, working together, uh, PM and R, both here at uh, Walter Reed and at Children's National. I will go with uh, Dr. D, uh, Medical Director of uh, Physical Medicine, Rehabilitation and Pain Management at Walter Reed, uh, Assistant Professor at USU, Department of Physical Medicine and Rehabilitation. He was an uh, infantryman uh, prior to medical school. Uh, he graduated from USU in 2012, completed his residency and fellowship at Walter Reed, is board certified, board certified in PMNR and uh, pain medicine, uh, multiple publications and post presentations related to rehabilitation and pain associated with active duty injuries. And we have Dr. Uh, Jeffrey uh, Rabin, uh, Associate Chief of Outpatient Rehabilitation Medicine and Director of Spasticity and uh, Brace Clinic at Children's National Medical Center. He's also an assistant professor at George Washington University with Department of Pediatrics. He's a consultant uh, pediatric uh, uh, physicist, uh, physicist. Well, yeah, I know, physicist. I'm like, man, some old warnings. Well, see, I'm working on talking. More coffee is the solution. Uh, throughout the Washington, D.C. area, uh, he's board certified in PMNR and uh, pediatric re rehabilitation, has multiple publications related to the recovery of children and youth uh, with traumatic brain injury and treatment of chronic pain within uh, pediatric patients. So thank you both uh, for coming in today. I know we had to reschedule you earlier, so I appreciate that as well. Um, and so warm welcome both virtually and in person. So All right, hey, thanks. Super excited to be here today. And I'm definitely really happy that Dr. Raven was able to join me today as he brings uh, a wealth of knowledge and expertise in pediatric pain management. So really excited to have him here with us today. So chronic pain management, extremely challenging, but can be very rewarding. The pediatric this piece to this definitely adds layers of complexity uh, with the whole parent-child dynamic, the school, unique school factors such as peer pressure, bullying, and these things that can amplify pain syndromes. Also, we really need to think about the neuroplasticity that can occur in chronic pain states, which can definitely have a bad outcome in the developing child during critical periods. So something to keep in mind. Uh, we hope to kind of change your perception of pain, chronic pain especially, and uh, chronic pain management in the pediatric population. So hopefully you get something out of this talk and we'll roll right into it. We of course have uh, no disclosures. The objectives today are really just to kind of familiarize yourself with modern concepts, uh, definitions, treatments, and chronic pain management. Also, just familiarize yourself with some outpatient management strategies, identify some chronic pain disorders and some available treatments, and really just know when to get help. Okay, so why is chronic pain management so important? Here are the numbers, right? We, we know that almost 2 million children in the U.S. suffer from chronic pain. We know that uh, adults with chronic pain often report chronic pain during childhood. Billions of dollars are spent every year on uh, healthcare in terms of treating chronic pain. And more importantly, we know that there are high rates of mental health comorbidity uh, in these patients uh, to include suicidal ideation and attempts. All right, so how do we define pain? I love this definition. So oftentimes we think of pain as simple nociception. So we have this noxious stimulus. We interpret the stimulus as, as pain, tissue injury. We react to it. Very simple way of thinking about pain. But we know that pain is more than that. It's an emotional experience, and it's an experience to that individual and that individual alone. So you can't really extrapolate one pain syndrome or tissue injury pattern to another patient and determine what type of pain that patient has compared to another or to yourself. 
It's also important to point out that pain can derive from actual tissue damage. We're, we're familiar with that. You touch a hot stove, you feel it. That's a legitimate uh, pain response. We also know in a lot of chronic pain states, there's not actual tissue damage happening. So it's just this perception that there is injury happening that makes these patients react to it in such a way that can be very maladaptive. All right, so here's some uh, definitions of pain. Nociceptive pain is something a lot of us are familiar with. The activation of peripheral nociceptors, that signal gets transmitted, we react to it. There's somatic and visceral types. Neuropathic pain is a lesion along the somatosensory nervous system. A lot of us are familiar with that. There's a newer term that's kind of uh, come up and it's called nosoplastic pain. So what is that? Well, this is the category of pain that encompasses your functional pain syndromes, your centralized pain states, uh, things like fibromyalgia, functional abdominal pain. These, these are pain etiologies that we believe aren't actual activation of nociceptors, uh, but they still have a lot of pain and comorbidity. The importance of this is that we often use different uh, mechanistic targets to treat these different types of pain. And so, for instance, for a nosoplastic pain state, we're probably not going to do very uh, a lot of interventional pain procedures on, on these patients. Uh, so it, it's just kind of important to stratify. But it's also important to note that some patients can have mixed pain, right? So nosoplastic pain patients can have neuropathic or nociceptive pain. Chronic pain, we usually say that it's pain lasting longer than three months. However, I like the latter part of this definition, and that is that it's pain lasting longer than the expected period of healing. How do we process pain? So we know that uh, transduction occurs via noxious stimulus. It's transmitted, it's modulated throughout the uh, CNS, and then it's perceived. And you could see the schematic here that kind of shows the multiple uh, synapses throughout the CNS and how we modulate pain. So what happens when you have chronic pain and things go haywire. I like to give the example of complex regional pain syndrome. So in DCRPS uh, patients, they have a peripheral sensitization. So their nociceptors are now firing at lowered thresholds. There's a barrage of signals, glial cell activation that occurs at the dorsal horn. There's interneuron crosstalk. And then all of a sudden now their light touch nerve fibers are transmitting pain signals right before your eyes. So these patients, you just lightly touch their skin and it feels like their skin's on fire. Very interesting, right? So yeah, typical patient, ankle sprain, 16 year old volleyball player comes in. Uh, they're describing this injury. Now they're having so much pain that they can't move their foot. They're crying because they lost their, uh, uh, potentially lost their uh, college scholarship. Uh, their parents are freaking out. And this is dropped in on your uh, outpatient clinic 15 minute appointment. So some of you may have experienced something like this. Um, uh, the table on the right, I adopted from our behavioral health colleagues. So this is a very simple way to think about pain. It's based on the gate theory. But I like it because it kind of shows patients this biopsychosocial uh, model in terms of how we can open the pain gate and also close it. So evaluating pain in pediatric patients is really tough. And really what I want you to do is consider function over number, right? So we know that um, you may have been called on the ward and patients in 13 out of 10 pain you know, the scale only goes up to 10. Um, you go up and see the patient, they're on a ton of Dilaudid or PCAs and they're barely breathing and they want you to treat, treat that number, right? Probably inappropriate. Same thing in chronic pain. Um, really don't wanna use just the number as an outcome. You really wanna pay attention. Hey, how are you to their sleep? How are you sleeping? Are you sleeping more now that we've tried it, this new treatment? Are you able to participate in school activities? Are you able to walk further? Are you able to run further? These are all more important measures uh, to follow in terms of uh, incorporating them back into their life. Uh, there are validated uh, pain interference uh, scale surveys, et cetera. This is the Promise Parent Proxy Item Bank, but 
if, if you don't have access or the time to use some of these surveys, I think simply just asking them uh, these, you know, common functional outcome um, questions are, are very appropriate as well. All right, another term to know is catastrophizing. So kind of similar to the patient that I was describing before, right? So you really wanna pick up on this when it shows up in your clinic, right? These are the patients who just totally wreck your clinic, right? As soon as you walk through the door, you can feel this visceral response, this energy, this devastation that's happening in this patient's life and also their parents and family members. And you really wanna pick this up because uh, this can uh, portend a very bad outcome. So really get these patients into behavioral health. And it's not only the patient that can demonstrate catastrophizing. So this is unique in the pediatric population. It could be the parent. So sometimes the parent is feeling a lot of this. So uh, that's why this concept of pain acceptance is so important. And we know that it's protective. So once you've ruled bad medical etiologies for chronic pain uh, uh, complaints, it's, it's good to kind of just normalize things. And kind of like I alluded to earlier, let the patient know that there's probably not tissue damage occurring, uh, that it's just your body's inappropriate way of interpreting those signals and functional restoration and normalcy back to life in school is of utmost importance. All right, so this is the biopsychosocial kind of approach. So we could see how these different domains can amplify pain. So sometimes people have genetic predisposition position to certain pain states of so collagen disorders, hypermobility, uh, anxiety can definitely feed into this. And then the school environment, as we talked about. So bullying, peer pressure, sports, scholarships, all those pressures can definitely amplify pain. Okay, so looking at um, different ways to treat pain. So the behavioral health aspect is very important. And I think the pain education piece up there can start in your clinic. And it can be as simply as having that patient uh, accept their pain and kind of normalize it for them, uh, give them some education on chronic pain, coach the parent and the child. And that can all start in the clinic uh, even before you refer to them behavioral health. These are some other behavioral health techniques that they often use. And I think the goal here too is, is to be taught some of these um, strategies that they can use independently outside the healthcare uh, setting. So biofeedback is something that they could do, diaphragmatic breathing, mindfulness. These are all techniques that can be learned and done outside of the healthcare setting, and it's important for their independence uh, to do so. All right, pharmacotherapy. So really tough in the pediatric population because a lot of the RCTs for uh, chronic pain medications are uh, in adults, right? So we don't have a lot of options. So we extrapolate a lot of that information and, and apply it to patients. So not a lot of great evidence. So a lot of this comes from anecdotal evidence, consensus guidelines, uh, expert opinion. Uh, on the left sided screen is more of your nociceptive targets. On the right side are more neuropathic. And then as you descend in the list, there's more controversial treatments um, that are mentioned. Yeah, so I, th I, th that's really tough. And I think uh, treating chronic pain patients, um, it, it's really hard to know because everybody's injury pattern is very different. I think in terms of risk versus benefit, it's something I like to try. I try a lot of topicals on my patients. Some of them think it works great. Some of them will tell me that it doesn't work at all. So it's really hard to get a good pulse on with, whether or not one type of patient's gonna to respond to a treatment versus another. And that's why we are talking about this kind of multi-mechanistic, multimodal approach. Um, just trying to find things that work and help that patient individually because that experience is their own. All right, so PT and OT, extremely important. Rehabilitation is, is an important uh, thing to consider in terms of promoting uh, mobilization. A lot of these patients have kinesiophobia. They're afraid to move their body. They're afraid to cause more tissue injury. It's not the case. They need to move, get back to normal life. We should emphasize active interventions. So 
things like exercise over passive. So some of these passive modalities are helpful, but they should not be the emphasis. We're really trying to get these patients to move. Complementary medicine. So acupuncture can be considered. It's potentially safe and effective. Uh, we think that it stimulates endorphin release. So if you have access to it, it can be helpful. Interventional or surgical, probably more for your older patients, uh, but these are some tools in my tool bag that I, that I can use in the sports medicine uh, interventional pain realm. Some patients with severe nerve injury or CRPS uh, may benefit from things like neuromodulation where we're uh, implanting a spinal cord stimulator. Um, there's a picture of a uh, ultrasound guided neuroma injection there, which is something we could do for uh, amputation patients. All right, so what does a multidisciplinary interdisciplinary approach team look like? So obviously a lot of people involved with a lot of tools in their tool basket. And we know that patients who are moderate to high risk of comorbidity accompanying chronic pain tend to return to school, return to sport much sooner when they are incorporated into this multidisciplinary approach. In terms of pain education, so these are some that I've adopted from some of my call, uh, some helpful items that I've adopted from some of my uh, colleagues. Elliot Crane, uh, TED Talk is, is an eight minute talk. He's a pediatric anesthesi anesthesiologist. And his message is that chronic pain is not a symptom, it's a disease. That's something we're trying to echo here today. Uh, really good talk. Uh, there's a pain curriculum out of Canada. It's free to everybody uh, via the web. Um, has some good modules that you can go through. Uh, would be good for residents, uh, fellows. Um, for parents and patients, I like this book, Why Do I Hurt? It really gets at pain science education and puts it in layman's terms. Breathe to Relax is a diaphragmatic breathing uh, app. Really helps you regulate, work on that descending inhibition pathway to kind of calm things down when you have pain flares, especially associated with anxiety. Exercise is medicine, uh, adopted from our sports medicine colleagues. So this is a good resource, has some good handouts that are age appropriate in terms of trying to implement exercise into your patients as part of the rehab program. This is a a uh, simple referral algorithm example. So really here, if they're at moderate high risk, demonstrating catastrophizing, get help, get help sooner, at a minimum behavioral health, if not this multidisciplinary or intensive interdisciplinary treatment approach. All right, let's get through some cases. So the whole goal here is we'll give you some cases and kind of show you how we approach this through a biopsychosocial uh, approach. All right, so this is a patient I see, saw a little while back. She's a 16-year-old female competitive rower referred by PT for this chronic uh, uh, hamstring strain. The pain is in the middle third of the hamstring. It's a twisting muscle type of pain. She denies any back pain, but sometimes has difficulty walking and notices that the pain spreads to her calf with uh, intensity. Um, she self-medicates with ibuprofen. She pushed through the season. Uh, it's been in PT for four months and really just feels like the pain is getting worse. So on exam, she has an antalgic gait, reduced popliteal angle on the left, um, otherwise pretty normal exam, except she has an absent Achilles reflex on the left side and then a positive straight leg raise. We looked at her MRI, it was normal. So, Based off her exam, we decided to get an MRI of the L-spine. So as we see here is a kind of paracentral left-sided L5-S1 disc protrusion abutting the S1 nerve root. So that totally correlated with her exam findings, right? So we were kind of in this uh, limbo of physical therapy, but we were kind of in, in the wrong diagnosis here. Uh, we did do a nerve conduction study EMG. And really, we had our diagnosis. This was just mainly to prove that there was no uh, axonal involvement or nerve injury. All right, so how do we approach this patient? Um, they wanted to see neurosurgery, which, which is appropriate. No surgery was recommended. Uh, we tried a gabapentin trial for pain management. We talked about epidural steroid injection. They deferred, which is totally fine. A lot of these discs resorb over time. 
Center to PT now to focus more on this radiculopathy picture and return to sport. And they were excited about starting some chiropractic, which they thought was helpful. Psychologically, it really was about expectation management and patient parent education. And then from the social aspect, it was reintegration of support. So 11 months, virtually pain-free, resumed growing. Kind of a, a, a good case there. All right, the next case is a facial pain patient. So this patient is an 18-year-old female. Here we have our diagnosis. diagnosis. She had craniofacial uh, fiber dysplasia and uh, subsequent trigeminal neuralgia. So she had this maxillary auricular pain, hurt uh, with um, just the wind blowing on her face, and then MRI brain showed a lesion that was concordant with her symptoms. Neurology was managing her neuropathic pain meds. Uh, she did some chiro and acupuncture, which was somewhat helpful. Um, and so one of the first things I think about as an interventionalist is, hey, I can put a needle next to that uh, pain generator. Um, so there is a Gasserian block and we could do a pulse radio frequency ablation. Um, and some of these patients do fairly well. Um, she of course deferred, which is totally fine. Uh, we, we talked about some off-label medications uh, if her neuropathic pain regimen um, was no longer effective. We uh, reassured her that she could continue chiropractic, acu acupuncture. And then we tried this cranial electrotherapy stimulation trial in the clinic. Basically two clips, uh, hooks it up to a little machine. There's some frequencies that go through br the brain that um, affect uh, pain modulation. She actually improved pretty well with that. Luckily, we were able to get TRICARE to approve uh, to purchase one for home use. Uh, we sent her to behavioral health. Uh, pain behavioral health for CBT biofeedback and really learn these techniques that she could use at college. She's about to start college in her first year semester. So uh, she really wanted to make sure she stayed on top of her pain. At eight month follow-up, she was doing really well with these uh, behavioral health strategies and the uh, cranial stem and overall pretty satisfied. All right. How long Uh, it, it kind of varies. So some of them will kind of put it on for so many minutes and then take it off. Uh, it, it's, it's variable. It, it's patient to patient. All right, Dr. Eben, I'll turn it over to you. You guys can hear me? So <clears throat> this was a case that fairly typical of what I might see in clinic. Um, our pain department at Children's for Chronic Pain is kind of divided up. Uh, we do different things. So for instance, I see a lot of kids with CRPS and uh, hypermobility spectrum disorders. Uh, we also have abdominal pain. We also have kids with POTS and probably you guys have probably heard of that before. And then there's a uh, and then we have a nurse practitioner who's really good who does a lot of trigger point injections. And one of the, the chief of the program does some blocks, you know, in the, in the OR. And she sees mostly anybody that comes in. And so uh, <clears throat> we have a couple of physical therapists that work with us as well. And then we have pain psychology also, which is a very important part Dr. D was talking about earlier. So... This could be a typical patient, a 16-year-old with chronic pain in multiple joints, described as achy, sharp, and tingling. So the reason I always ask about the quality of the pain for them to describe it is because then if going back to the earlier part of the talk, you can kind of figure out what's generating the pain, whether it's inflammatory or whether it's neuropathic. And people that have pain in multiple joints, they may have a combination of both. So the treatment approach might be a little bit different depending on uh, what type of pain they're having. And so it's ex exacerbated by activities such as running, like in physical education class, going upstairs, feel like their hips dislocate. And so I already know that they're hypermobile, you know, just by the history. And so uh, they're fairly sedentary because of kinesiophobia. They're fearful that any activity they do is going to cause more pain. But when they sit around not doing anything, thinking about pain, it just gets worse. So they become very anxious and all they think about is pain. Sleep is affected and they wanna play volleyball again. So 
generally speaking, when I see them, they've already seen rheumatology, orthopedics, neurology. They've had a mega workup. Generally speaking, it's negative. Nothing's really positive for any of it. And they've tried multiple medications. Uh, gabapentin, ibuprofen can help. And Prozac, because people, they want to treat their anxiety and depression. But when you use an SSRI, they don't really seem to have much effect on uh, helping with any of the chronic pain or the neuropathic pain. Which one's? Okay, so on physical exam, you guys know what the Baton score is? So the Baton score is kind of an uh, idea of how hypermobile somebody is. So it a, it's a, goes up to a nine. So if you have, so you're looking at the upper extremities, if you have them extend their arm and they hyperextend more than 10 degrees, that's a, that's a one point. If you can have their finger and you can extend it to 90 degrees or more, that's a point. If you can touch their thumb to their forearm, that's a point. So you have six points for your upper extremities. If you look at them standing uh, in the sagittal plane, if their knees hyperextend by more than 10 degrees, that's a point for each knee. And then the controversial part is if they could touch the floor with their palms without bending their knees, that's another point. So it's up to a nine point scale. That kind of gives you an idea of how tight they are or how loose they are, uh, but it's not, it doesn't explain everything because some kids that have a Baton score of four are really hypermobile in a lot of other places besides what's on the Baton scale. And then other kids, may have a five, but they're not as hypermobile. But anybody over a five could be a genetic cause for hypermobility. Now, not everybody that's hypermobile has pain. And if you look at Michael Phelps, if you watch him in the Olympics, he could kind of like dislocate his elbow before he swam. And he could bend his fingers all the way back like that. And he could do like this and his fingers would go to the other side of his back. And he's a really big guy, but I'm not aware that he has any pain. He might, but. I think that helped him with his swimming, <laughs> being like flexible like that. Um, so typically you see the kids that they have a bait and score that's pretty high or this particular patient. Then they get trapezial trigger points. I've seen a lot of that lately, you know, off of this particular case in virtual teaching in the last year and a half, they're sitting at their computer like this for eight hours a day. And they all get trapezial trigger points. Because you know, for me, if I'm in clinic and I have to type notes, I'm not a very good typer because I'm very old. And I get them just from typing. And so they all have them. And then the trigger points can cause them to have tension headaches. So they may have headaches as well. Uh, they'll sit with a kyphotic posture. So you're looking at them, they're kind of like this. And their parents are always saying, sit up straight, sit up straight. Well, they can't really because they're so loose that it's hard for them to sit up straight. So that's another thing. When earlier, when they were talking about going upstairs causes pain, well, the patella are pretty hypermobile also. That's not part of the Baton scale, but oftentimes when they're sitting for prolonged periods of time and they stand up, their, their patella is already subluxated laterally and then they'll push it medially and that causes pain or going up the stairs causes pain, usually more going up than down. Um, you know what the over test is? So overtest is really you have them lie on their side with their lower leg extended, and then you, you, have, you flex the knee and bring the top leg back. It should actually go below your knee when you let it go. Their overtest, they may be so tight here that they can't. And then they'll say, you know, my, my hip dislocates when I'm walking all the time, and it's really uncomfortable. It's because the greater trochanter of their femur is, is catching on the, IT, the iliotibial band. So it feels like it's dislocating, but it's not really. So if you have that, you want to check for that. And even though they're hypermobile, some of their muscles could be pretty tight. Uh, so they can get tight hamstrings, they can get tight, tight rectus femoris. Any of the two joint muscles tend to be, can get tight. Uh, just like you see with kids with growing, when they have a growth spurt, they can get tight at those joints too, but it doesn't mean they're gonna have pain. Um, so when they're sitting down and you look at their feet, they can have really well-developed longitudinal arches. When they stand, they, they have flexible foot pronation. That can cause ankle pain. A lot of these kids can roll their ankles really easily. 
So you can kind of get an idea of they're having pain in multiple joints from the hypermobility. And then when they're doing high impact activities like running and jumping, then they have all that motion in the joint that causes inflammation. So you get the inflammatory pain. But with hypermobility, you can also have compressed peripheral nerves more easily. And so you can get neuropathic pain on top of that. So sometimes you're looking at treating both of them. Uh, so we would call that an amplified pain syndrome, secondary to hypermobility, and then the hypermobility spectrum disorder with kinesiophobia. So just to backtrack on hypermobility, there's benign joint hypermobility, and then there's the genetic cause of joint hypermobility. The genetic cause is really Ehlers-Danlos syndrome, and the most common is the hypermobile type. But there's no genetic test for that, it's all clinical. So I don't make the clinical diagnosis for that because even though I know what it is, but they kind of lump in benign joint hypermobility and hypermobile Ehlers-Danlos into one thing called the hypermobility spectrum disorder because they present very similarly and treatment is pretty similar. So at our hospital, the geneticists make those diagnoses, um, although some other people think they can, but they, there's a lot more criteria than hypermobility to give you a, a diagnosis of Ehlers-Danlos syndrome. Uh, there's a whole lot of criteria that they changed it in 2017. So, um, but the, the presentation is similar. Um, also iliotibial band syndrome, patella femoral ins insufficiency or instability, you know, that's why they're having knee pain. And then all the anxiety that's associated with it, plus or minus trigger points, plus or minus headaches. So those are all part of the, what you see. Um, so what can we do? Well, they already tried gabapentin, it didn't really help. So if you think back to that list of potential pain medications, um, I find that if you, whenever you're, Whenever you go into practice, there's all kinds of new medications that come around all the time. So a very wise person when I was younger told me, pick a couple that have a track record, get familiar with the side effects and the effects of the medication and stick with them for a while. So you, so you feel comfortable with it and you know what you're doing. And then you can add medications as you think may be helpful. Medications in kids, in my opinion, are really secondary to the to the therapies being the physical therapy, the cognitive behavioral therapy, as well as the, um, um, some of the bracing that we can do in physical medicine that nobody else really knows about. Um, <clears throat> so clonidine can be very helpful. It's an alpha agonist and it can really help with sleep. It's not a sleeping medication, but it can allow kids to get to sleep. It helps with anxiety. It can help with neuropathic pain. Um, and they even use it to treat ADHD in some cases. So there's a lot of off-label uses, although pain is not off-label anymore. I believe that it first started with amputees, actually in the military, who are having phantom limb pain. You know, everybody gets phantom sensation, but phantom limb pain's pretty hard, it's horrendous pain. And probably they were hypertensive, so they gave them clonidine, <laughs> but it helped with the pain. So that's how we got into, as far as I know, treating pain with quantity. It can be very effective. Potentially it can lower uh, your blood pressure, your heart rate. I haven't really seen that in kids very much, but if they come in with a low blood pressure and a low heart rate, I, I don't recommend that. Um, the physical therapy, uh, when I prescribe it, I really want them to work on joint stabilization. And I tell the family, if you're looser in one direction than another, you're gonna subluxate in that direction. If you're stronger than one direction than another, the muscles only pull, it'll pull you out of joint. It's a multi-directional instability in these kids. So there's not a really a surgical option, although there are surgeons out there who try to do some treatments, but they don't really last very long because the ligaments are still loose. Um, and so, a, so, they, so I have them do generalized joint stabilization, core strengthening or activation if they're younger uh, to help them be able to do more activities, pelvic still, Stabilization and stability, which would be ITB, strengthening, stress, stretching, you know, vestus medialis, obliquus, vestus medialis, strengthening. Uh, they work on proprioception, balance, posture, all those things that they can work on. I always want them to give a home program 
um, most of the kids don't do their own program because who, who likes to do that? But if they do, you know, it can, it can be helpful. Aquatic therapy can be very helpful for these guys because it really unweights their joints quite a bit from the buoyancy in the water. Uh, and most of them like it. And then orthotics can be extremely helpful. So there's a thing called a DMO suit, which stands for dynamic movement orthosis. And you guys here have a very good orthotist uh, who's in charge. It's a woman, I can't remember her name, but a guy I work with wanted to hire her out of here and she said no. So um, she's very good. So you have to be certified in doing a DMO. It's a bodysuit that's made out of Lycra. So it's soft, but there are elastic panels that are sewn into the suit that cue the muscles to move without the kids or adults knowing that they're being cued to move. So it's a dynamic suit. So it actually can get you stronger the more consistently you wear it, but it'll also provide stability at your shoulders and your trunk and your hips so that you really start to sit up straighter more consistently than it's worn. And I'd say 70, 75% of these patients like them. Not everybody does. They're very, they're, they're tight. They're very compressive, but a lot of people like that. And um, so that's a very good uh, orthotic to get. Uh, custom foot orthotics, if you, if you notice they have flexible foot pronation, they have ankle pain or knee pain, it can really hold them in subtail or neutral, provide arch support, and that may make them feel a little bit better and it helps with their mobility. Most people like that. There are, I tell the families, I can give you so many braces, you look like a Robocop when you leave because we can do patellar stabilizing braces, ankle stabilizing braces. We can do if the kids roll over and when they're sleeping at night and dislocate or subluxate their shoulder, I can put them in an armadillo brace, which stabilizes their shoulder so they can sleep better. Just depends on what, what's needed. Acupuncture can be very helpful. And a lot of kids are needle phobic. Uh, so I just tell them, well, you know, the acupuncture needles are very thin and they come to a point and you, they really don't hurt. And as opposed to the needles, you get a flu shot with or blood drawn, which are cut at an angle and they're beveled. And when you go into the skin, it tears the skin and that can cause pain. Or when you're injecting into a closed space in your muscle, that can be painful. But acupuncture generally doesn't hurt. And in fact, I, I talked to our acupuncturist for one of my kids and I brought it home. I was trying to get the needles in them and they kept bending because they're so flexible. So you have this little tube you can use. Fortunately, he said, yeah, it's not hurting dad, it's fine. So, um, but, uh, but that can be a, a, a big help. Um, pain psychology is very important if you can get the teenagers to buy into it. So I tell them they're not looking for your deep dark secrets. They're not interested in who you like. They just wanna to try to help you cope with the pain so you can function at, at a 15 or 16 year old level and socialize and get out and do things. Um, and so they, so oftentimes it's very helpful to do that. And our psychologists will meet with the kids and the parents individually, and then they'll meet, and then they'll come up with a treatment plan if they feel that it'll be beneficial. And oftentimes it is. And I also tell them, you know, there's, there's nobody that can promise you to get rid of all your pain. That's not the goal. The goal is to get your pain under enough control that you can function normally despite having it. And, you know, because anybody that tells you, oh yeah, I can get rid of all your pain, you may want to consider leaving because I don't see that anybody can say that. Although oftentimes we can get it under better control, but the family dynamic is very important because some of these cases, there's a lot of secondary gain through pain for both parents and the kids. So, you know, you can walk in the room and within two minutes, you know whether you can help the kid or not because of the dynamic that you see when you walk in. That, that just comes with experience. But everybody you know, deserves a chance to feel better. Exercise is very important. These kids have to do low impact exercise, like swimming, uh, walking, elliptical machines, a stationary bike with minimal tension, you know, resistance. I mean, because uh, the exercise actually can help with sleep. It can help with appetite. A lot of these kids don't have a very good appetite. It can help with concentration in school. And it also produces endorphins, so it helps with pain as well. So it's very important to start doing an exercise routine. And there's a little crossover with fibromyalgia in kids along with the hypermobility spectrum pain, the amplified pain. So those, those recommendations go for both of those types of 
diagnoses. And so that's important. What Dr. D was saying earlier, hydration is very important. I say, how do you know if you're hydrated? Because they'll say, oh, we, we carry bottles around with us and we have to drink you know, a million ounces of water a day. I'm like, okay, but how do you know if you're hydrated? And they'll be like, some of the kids will go, oh, when you pee. I said, exactly. So if you're, when you wake up in the morning, if you slept all night, it doesn't have to be clear because you've been sleeping all night. So it'll be more concentrated. But during the day, if you pee and you realize it's not clear, then you really, you know, you need to drink more. So that's a way to get them to buy into being more hydrated. And sleep hygiene is very important. They need, teenagers need eight to 10 hours a night is the recommendation. So one of the things I try to get them to do is stop their electronics an hour before bed, which is almost impossible. And it's, uh, but it's very important. And even when you put it on the dim light, it still makes, fools your body into thinking that it's the middle of the afternoon. So why are you gonna go to sleep? And then social media, you know, it's, it's and TikTok, it's, uh, it, it's important. So some of the parents will be agreeing with that. And they'll be like, well, I try to get them to do that. And I was like, so I'm like, well, you know, and I'll tell the kids, you know, maybe you want to listen to your mom. They actually know things that may be helpful because at that age, they don't really want to listen. So, um, <clears throat> so that, so for this, this case, you know, this is typically what I see a lot and this would be the approach. And it's, Oftentimes, when they start to buy into it, they start to feel a lot better. I had a, a young lady who I started treating her when she was in middle school, and she's in college now, and she did a telehealth with me. And she said, you know, I have to be honest with you. I started doing some of the things you recommended since I've been in college, and I feel a lot better. And in high school, I never really did it. And I said, oh, so you were just giving me lip service every time you came in. She goes, well, yeah. And I said, well, I figured. But, <laughs> but so it does work if you just have to get them to buy into it and want to do it. And so <clears throat> here's a, a, a 15 year old male soccer player with low back pain. It doesn't have to be male. This just was a male. Uh, it's worse by playing soccer, referred by orthopedics. The pain is described as dull and achy, which is more inflammatory pain to me. Uh, X-rays are negative for spondylolisthesis, um, uh, and rest didn't improve his symptoms. So by the history, you kind of know what this is, right? Most likely, it's a, a pars a reaction or a pars fracture. And, um, so they have very tight hamstrings. So hamstrings, uh, they bend your knee when we walk, but they're the major hip extensor when we're walking. So if your hamstrings are really tight and a lot of 15 year olds who don't have pain have really tight hamstrings because they're growing rapidly, it really pulls on your lower back. So that's a reason you can have low back pain just from tight hamstrings. Sacroilia joints can be tender. Um, I'm a DO, so I learned how to do manipulation in the pain clinic. We can do, I can do that. And some of the kids will be like, oh my God, I feel better right away. But you know, it comes back again. Um, otherwise, they're exempt, pretty unremarkable. The reflexes are fine, the strength is fine. Uh, to me, that's a uh, part of stress reaction. And so some of the orthopedists will, they will put them in a back brace. I have never seen one of them to work very well. It's really, you have to avoid the activities that cause the pain. And so any type of hyperextension activity on your, on your lumbar spine is gonna cause the pain. So if you're prescribing physical therapy, you put that in as a precaution. So in physical medicine, we always have to, when we write prescriptions for therapy, you have to fill in the precautions. And if you take your oral boards and you don't do it, then they're, they're gonna ding you for that. So as you know, right? <laughs> so. So um, you, so you have to put precautions, and that would be the precaution I would say. Like for the last patient, the hypermobile kid, I would say no high impact activities, no progressive resistance exercises with weights. For this guy, I would say no extension exercises to the lumbar spine. Um, and then what happens is all that repeated extension and kicking, even the lacrosse, a lot of extension and. and and using the lacrosse racket, weightlifting, football, they all get these injuries. Uh, and that happens fairly frequently. And it's, uh, it can be treated, but 
occasionally if they do get a spondylolisthesis and the pain's really bad, we have a couple orthopedists that will do operate on them to stabilize it, which is kind of new for me, but I've been doing this for a long time. So, but it, it can be helpful. Uh, <clears throat> but this is something that you may see. So, um, back pain. So non steroidals as needed, uh, physical therapy for core and hamstring stretching, uh, no extension exercises, plus or minus a lumbar stabilization brace. Uh, and then these are the other parts of the program that can be helpful. Um, so sometimes you see one thing and then you see another injury and then you put two and two together and you realize that one kind of predisposed the patient to have the other injury. So we have a 12 year old young lady who's a dancer <coughs> and she has left ankle pain after quote, rolling her ankle several months ago. The pain worsens and she describes it as burning in nature. So what's burning? <coughs> That's neuropathic pain to me. Uh, it keeps her awake at night. She can't put weight on the foot and she doesn't even wanna wear socks because she has allodynia. And so, uh, the foot and the ankle can change color and that can have intermittent swelling. So there's some dysautonomic changes. X-rays and MRI are negative, although sometimes in the MRI you can see some inflammatory changes, but that's about it. Non-steroidal anti-inflammatories have been helpful and she's about to start physical therapy. So what would you think the injury would be here? So I would say it's CRPS. So there are two types of CRPS, CRPS1 and CRPS2. CRPS1 is just a generalized pain that you can't really attribute to a specific nerve injury. CRPS2 is associated with a specific nerve injury. So the common fibular nerve, which used to be the perineal nerve, is right below the, right here on your, on your lat. And you can actually touch it and roll the nerve underneath your finger because it's very superficial. That can get injured. I've seen that several times um, just from compression. Um, and, that, and that would be a type two injury. You know, the, the radial nerve here, that can, you can see that. As, that can be injured. I used to be a natural. And then. Okay. Um, and so that would be a type two. Type one's way more common than type two is. And. So on exam, she's pretty hypermobile in her joints. Her left foot has allodynia. Allodynia is, you know, you can look at it to touch it and they start screaming. And so hyperalgesia, you can touch it and it's uncomfortable. Allodynia, they don't even want you to look at it. They can't move their foot during muscle testing um, and the skin can be modeled. And there can also be temperature changes. Uh, and the, what you see is you'd think that the affected side would be warmer, but in this, it's actually cooler. But the, so the affected limb is cooler than the other limb. So if you, che you can check that, but it's not that specific for CRPS, but that's something that you can notice when you see it. Um, so CRPS1, secondary to subluxation from hypermobility spectrum disorder. That's what I would say it is. And so how do we treat it? So. Do you guys know what contrast baths are? So a contrast bath is an old physical medicine treatment. I'll, I'll give us credit for that, or what we do. And it's, and it's alternating between warm and cold water. And for some reason, that seems to reset the nerves. And nobody knows why, but it can be very helpful when it works. And none of these things always work. But so I have a recipe that I, or instructions that I give out. It takes a half an hour. It's not that hot and it's not that cold, but oftentimes people feel much better afterwards. Not always, but often. So it's worth trying. Physical therapy, we like to do desensitization. So desensitization, so you can actually put a sock on the foot or, or sleep with covers on your foot in, when you're in bed. And you start out with, there are multiple textures you, that are used and you start out with one that you can tolerate. So it may be like a hair dryer that's not on warm or cold, but just regular air. And you just go over the area for a couple minutes. Then you may want to try a cotton ball. Then you may want to try terry cloth. 
then as the textures get more, more firm as the patients tolerate it. And so they do that in therapy, but they also need to do it at home a few times a day to get used to it. Uh, and so mirror therapy is really cool. Uh, they'll put a mirror in fr and block the one leg that's affected, and then they'll have them do active motion with the other leg. And they actually start doing it with, when they look in the mirror, they think that it's the affected leg that's moving and they start moving it. And it's, it's kind of cool. It's, uh, so that's part of the therapy. And then progressive weight bearing is very important. It's the thing that makes it better is weight bearing. It's just a thing they don't want to do. And you have to convince them that's what's going to make them better. And they don't, look, they don't believe you until they start doing it. Uh, I like clonidine or amitriptyline for pain. Amitriptyline can be very effective. I, we go very low dose. So once you go over, I think, 40 milligrams, you've got to check an EKG. But below that, <laughs> thank you. <laughs> but below that, you don't really have to. And so, um, so I start with 10, which some people think is a homeopathic dose, but oftentimes it's, it's enough. And it allows them to sleep, but it also has really good effects on neuropathic pain. Acupuncture, once again, pain psychology, patient and family education, they're all very important. And you're not treating just the CRPS, but also treating the hypermobility because in the history, oftentimes they will tell you that they've hurt multiple joints, not just that one, but that's the one that has CRPS. CRPS can recur in kids and people will go online now because doing medicine now compared to 20 years ago is a lot different because everybody's Googling everything. And they'll say, CRPS just doesn't get better. I'm like, well, yeah, it actually can get better and usually does, and, but it can recur. And uh, so I'll just say, what were you saying? Yeah. <laughs> so <laughs> it can be a complex and require a lot of management strategies. It's, you have to think of a multidisciplinary approach because that really helps the most. Uh, you need to be on top of it. You need to follow, have these kids follow up with you. You need to, like, they all have my email, even though our hospital wants them to use the portal now. And so they're constantly messaging. But, uh, and then you have to change your treatment approach based on how they respond. You know, when you're treating a kid, you're not treating just the patient. You're treating everybody. And that's very important to remember that you don't always know to realize when you're young <laughs> that you're going to be treating the whole family. And so uh, it's, it can be very rewarding just when you're thinking, why am I doing this for a living? Uh, then they, somebody gets better and they're like, thank you so much. I can do everything I want to do again. And they're like, oh, okay, well, that's worth it. <laughs> so. Leave it up for questions. So what I say, just like I said earlier, I'm like, I'll say, well, are you seeing anybody from, to talk about your pain, Any, anybody from psychology or a counselor? And sometimes they are already seeing somebody for anxiety, but not necessarily who's trained in pain with anxiety. So we have, we have psychologists who are PhDs, but then they've done a separate fellowship in pain management. So those are the ones that I like to refer them to. And then I'll say, you know, they're, like I said earlier, they're, they're, they don't think, nobody thinks you're crazy because you're not. They're not looking for your deep, dark secrets. They just want to try to help you develop coping mechanisms so you can function. So the pain's not running your life. Usually the parents buy into that first, but then the kids, a lot of these kids are pretty smart and they will agree. And a lot of these kids are type A, you know, they're, they're driven. They want to get straight A's. They want to go to Ivy League schools. And they have a lot of pressure on them, especially in Montgomery County around here. Um, I can tell you uh, that's, that's a big deal. And, and they get to the point where they're really good athletes and they get to the point where they can't take it anymore. And a little injury becomes a major problem for them. So pain psychology can be very important. Unfortunately, right now in the whole country, because of COVID, a lot of kids have been self-medicating with things that are not helping them, but they think they are. And so you can't even get an appointment with a psychologist in most places now because they're just inundated. So a lot of the primary 
physicians are taking over and prescribing SSRIs and things like that for kids. SSRIs don't help with pain. One SNRI can help with pain, the Cymbalta or Duloxetine when it works, but they're, they're just overwhelmed. And hopefully when kids are going back to school and socializing again and getting out of the house, it'll be helpful for them. But does that answer your question? I'll just add sometimes um, when we're talking about pain science education to, uh, and we're talking about a behavioral health referral for pain psychology, I often like to tell my patients that we need to tackle this pain from the inside out and not only the outside in. And they've been fairly receptive to that once you explain how pain works and all the features. I haven't really had many patients uh, just totally refuse, but you will have some that are just totally against it for whatever reason. So that might be just something to consider. Well, today, general pediatricians refer everybody out. <laughs> and so I, I think if they really, <laughs> I'm, I'm maybe not the ones here, but I can tell you my stepfather's a pediatrician. He would roll over in his grave right now if he knew how pediatrics was these days. There are some really good pe pediatricians and there are ones who will just want to see healthy kids and everything else they refer out. So we get these referrals. We got a lot of self-referrals. They'll look us up on the internet and, and make an appointment and just come in. And so I think that if they feel comfortable, and there are some really good pediatricians who do feel comfortable treating this, and, and they try and it works, that's fine. But if they get frustrated and they feel like, okay, I'm not getting anywhere, then it would be time to send to the pain clinic. Now, even us, we'll try a lot of different modalities like we just talked about. And sometimes they don't, kids don't get better. So then I'll refer them to an inpatient pain program, and there are several in the country, and to help them. Uh, the one that Mayo Clinic's really good, there's one in Boston, there's one at uh, Cleveland Clinic, there's one, uh, well, Kennedy, Kennedy Krieger has one, so. Yeah, I'd just like to add, um, definitely, uh, when you pick up those elements of catastrophizing, that's a big red flag, and you should probably consider uh, getting help sooner than later. And then of course you guys do great heads exams, uh, social histories, things like that. Once you start to notice this pain, um, you know, kind of expanding beyond just a normal pain state or tissue injury, you should start thinking about getting help, especially if it's impacting school, sleep, uh, and other aspects of life. And speaking of school, we don't, they all want to stay home from school. So we, none of us recommend staying home. They got to go back to school. Sometimes they go on a part-time basis and gradually integrate the whole day. But when they stay at home, the pain just gets much worse and they, they circle down the drain. They get, it gets much, much more significant. Longer lines, uh, in terms of ease of access, probably more typical students are just going to school So like if you have a whole, you know, I think for a lot of students, like, oh, you've got back, you've got, some sort of what we think is muscle skeletal goes into the knee. And then, as you said, that might actually sort of be the wrong direction. So, are there like, so other than catastrophizing, are there other sort of either syndromes or red flags that would be like, don't send a PT and send it to the medicine? You know, so you might then give a much more holistic. <laughs> Well, what I see with, they'll see somebody else like an orthopedic surgeon or, and they'll say, send them to physical therapy because their shoulder's hurting them, but they're missing the rest of the picture and the therapist just focus on that one area. And so, and then if they don't have the proper precautions in there, because a lot of people just write physical therapy and that's all they put down and instead of why they're sending them and what the problem is. And so they let the therapist decide what they're going to do. Uh, so I think it's important to look at everything and then really uh, prescribe what you want them to do and, and how you want them to proceed. Are there 
residential tax fee with penalty of the employment market or So I, I hopefully all of our clinical notes go to the primary care physician, and I will have them call me periodically when they have difficult patients, you know, trying to uh, I understand what the treatment plan would be to coordinate it with them. And so, yeah, it depends on the pediatrician and what the patient is like. I've had some pediatricians who are really involved, and it's really great that they are. And so you work out a care plan with them. But most of the time, they're just like, yeah, okay, go take care of these guys. So, Yeah, I, th I think sometimes uh, I'll just make a recommendation and have the patient follow up with their primary care. If it's something simple, relatively simple, straightforward, I think it's totally reasonable. And then just kind of follow up PRN. All right. Well, thank you. Thank you both very much. That was excellent. Excellent talk. So thank you.